Now, my topic, and when I was going over what I was going to speak about today, um, I was going through my mental Rolodex of the myriad of issues that I see and why I believe there's a problem, okay? This is not going to be my nuts and bolts on special education law. Uh, we offer those all the time, but believe me, if you want to be involved in one of those, uh, we give those out for free. Just invite me in. It's not a big deal. I would love to do it. But those conferences uh, would typically run about nine to four with just me and my partner explaining this from top to bottom uh, with regards to special education law, the regulations, our strategies that we recommend, uh, behavior, all of those things. This is a macro approach of where I think that we're having some major problems. Uh, and I'm going to start societally, and then I'm gonna bring it down and, and let you guys know my perspective from where I sit when I'm going into the schools as to why we're having a, a greater problem um, in how we're approaching not only our special needs children, but also our, neuro our, our typical children. Uh, within our public education system. Um, now, I haven't been asked to the table and I am not running for president yet, but I will tell you that it, there, right now it just sort of seems like there's just noise out there. Nobody's really offering any solutions. And it's really virulent and oppressive. This is exactly what's going on inside of our schools. And we have a crisis, and I, before, and I'm going to get into it, I am not a reformer. I do not believe in reform. I believe that you have to start and chart a new path. You don't hand more money and more power to the very programs or people that got you in the mess to begin with. That is my stance, and I absolutely believe that 100%. So on a macro level, when we started this country, we were a sociocentric country before the United States was founded. And there was that battle philosophically between the ideas of individualism and those of a sociocentric, of a central authority uh, to where everybody answered and responded to that. Well, we know that even during the revolution that there was always a battle between the minority who believed in this idea of individualism. You had your majority that was quite neutral through their support behind whoever happened to occupy their city at the time. And then you had the ones that supported the sociocentric continuation of the crown. Individualism won out. And because of that, we got two very beautiful and timely documents. I know there are some out there that may think Oh, well, those are outdated. I do not believe that they are outdated on any level. And I believe that the genius that went into how these contracts uh, were put together will be known. So, and understand that both of these documents, these are experiments in freedom. If you look at all of human history, all of human history, what you'll see is that Humankind has only been truly free or individuals for a very, very short span of that immense history. What we are doing in this country and what has been adopted in other countries, that's, this is fairly new. This notion of individual rights, this notion of individualism within a cohesive society. So, what I love about the founders is that when they wrote the Bill of Rights specifically, and when they wrote the Constitution, they guaranteed individual liberty and freedom for some at that point. But the document does not specify that. It says for all. All men were created equal. All people were created equal. And people always say, well, that was such a conflict. See, I don't think so. I think they knew exactly what they were doing. And they knew that, there would, what, that what they were doing is creating a conflict within these documents that we as a people would have to figure out over time, which we did, unfortunately. Sometimes we can figure that out legislatively. Uh, for example, during uh, the time when we were trying to determine 
uh, how, how to satisfy or solve that quandary of, of, of equality, um, we would have stuff like the Missouri Compromise, or we would have the Mason-Dixon line. But legislation at some point, and the judicial system at some point, failed to answer and respond and, and solve that, that question that, that uh, quite frankly, our Bill of Rights and our Constitution had inserted into this, uh, our social fabric, which, of course, was answered at the end of the Civil War, thus expanding this idea of individualism and expanding it to even more people within this country. Well, that set up the next group of questions. And then we had the women's suffrage movement, and the vote was extended, and the rights extended, those notions and ideas of individualism. Then we had to answer the question of equal rights once again to reconfirm within the civil rights movement that this is something that needed to be enjoyed by all and we needed to write it down in such a way to where those could be guaranteed uh, legislatively, judicially, and through the executive branch. But once again, remember, this is only an experiment. Whether this continues, whether we continue to believe in these notions of individualism, or we start to gravitate toward back to what I think is our habitual nature as humans into more of a sociocentric uh, type of ideal of, of an authority, um, is yet to be seen. Now, where are we now? And this is the frightening aspect. Because of 9-11, um, and because I believe our society, uh, including myself, uh, sort of knee-jerked um, and, and really did embrace this idea of, of this um, safety obsession, well, we adopted the Patriot Act. We've been in this nonstop war on terror. And in my viewpoint, has sort of altered the way that we're starting to look at our individualism. And now we sort of have returned to these notions and these ideas of being sociocentric. And because of that, um, we have some real divisions in this country now, where we have so many opposing viewpoints, and it's starting to get very virulent uh, in, in the discussions of who is right, who's wrong, which direction are we going to take this country. Now. The word tyrant, we tend to view that, we tend to isolate it towards some king or an emperor or whatever. And that isn't what the word means. It is just any person who exercises power in a cruel way. That could be you. That could be me. At any given time, if we are in some kind of perceived position of power over somebody else, be it our children, pets, uh, let's say you're in your job, uh, employees, let's say in a school, over a classroom, a principal, over the teachers, the superintendent. You see how that pyramid continues to go up. Now the entire topic or the thing that I believe has occurred in this country is something I refer to as trickle-down tyranny. And I believe since you know, and I'm probably wrong, and if there's any history or sociology people in here, then we can banter about that at some other time. But I do believe, and I sort of peg um, September 11th as sort of the time period where we've made this shift, where we have this trickle-down tyranny. And because of that, it's sort of thrown all of us out of whack. So, a tyrant will grind down the people around them. And instead of turning against the tyrant, those people will crush those beneath them. Now, I sort of paraphrase this from Emily Bronte, but she's not going to care. Um, but if you think about this, and you apply it in your own life, and how at various times, depending on your perceived power over other people, and like I said, as a parent over your children, we are now in a position to where, instead of responding to those that are utilizing this power in an incorrect manner toward ourselves, we, in an effort to, I guess, isolate some kind of control or have some kind of power over our dominion, 
around us, we tend to exert that same kind of treatment toward those within our sphere. And then it becomes a perpetual cycle. And that's why more people I talk to, the more people I talk to, they feel stifled. They feel an immense pressure that they cannot see. They just feel like everything's chaotic and out of control. This is why you have so many different mechanisms that are impacting us. And, and I, I don't care if it's a dog catcher, the mailman, um, you know, the, the school. I mean, it just doesn't matter. Each individual person that has some kind of perceived control, some of them are using it in a wrong and illegal and oppressive manner, thus creating a response in us. So what do we teach our children in my house? The golden rule. Treat others as you want to be treated. Now, we used to actually learn this in school as far as this principle, and it was reinforced. And it is the notion, because what's the opposite of treating other people like you want to be treated? A hypocrite, and you don't want to be that. You know, in fact, in the school system, I was sitting in a school meeting, um, oh, it must have been a couple years ago, and actually went to trial, a due process trial. And the, the principal sat there and said, well, this kid called me a hypocrite, and then you know, read out the statement where he had been disciplined for calling her a hypocrite. And of course, in my examination, I said, are you? I mean, let's look at the record. Are you a hypocrite? And I mean, she was offended by it. But the point I then laid out in the documentation was exactly what we've been referring to. The child had a behavior contract. They were not complying and following. He was earning his rewards. They were refusing to give them to him. So he had hit the nail on the proverbial head. Absolutely. So treating other people, and I think that there's some disconnect sometimes as adults when I go into schools where our children, our parents are treated substandardly or treated in a way that doesn't meet the standard. And it ends up causing a whole bunch of unnecessary problems to where parents have to call me to try to fix it. To where most of the cases that we end up dealing with in special education and in civil rights center completely around communication and an exertion and use of power that did not need to be there. It was an irresponsible use of power. All things that cost us money because it's unnecessary to have to pay me attorney fees and, and I make the schools pay. I do not charge parents for my representation. It's their right. It's a punishment. Hopefully the school learns their lesson and doesn't do it again. So by doing that, we are consuming a tremendous amount of unnecessary resources in policing, in our prison systems, in our court systems, all because we have the safety obsession and this obsession with forcing other people to comply with our wills. You know how sick I am to see disciplinary reports where I see the word defiance? I am so sick of that. I am defiant 24 hours of my waking day. Yet these children are being charged inside school with defiance. I don't ever see anything in there that's positive how are we going to teach replacement behaviors? What are we going to do to, to help the child learn that this is not the appropriate way to talk to me? We've got some problems. How do I know we have problems? Our public schools. Now, I don't know if you guys know the significance of the canary in the mine, but the coal miners used to bring canaries into the mine with them because the canary would be highly susceptible to the gases. And the canary would die before uh, it would impact uh, negatively uh, the miners. And so they would have canaries strewn throughout the mine and they would watch them and if the canary died, then the miners knew that the gases had built up and they needed to, to leave. We use that description as sort of the same indicator, an alert for us in a grander scale for society that we look at our canaries 
And I look at our public schools and I'm seeing some major, major problems. Now our children's first experience with government and this experiment in freedom and individualism, they learn it in the public schools. That is their first experience with a government agent, a government representative. And some of the lessons that they're learning, uh, quite frankly, are abhorrent. And it just shocks me that at 18 years old, we want to release them out to society and say, vote, you're free, you're a citizen now. But yet, we are not producing or providing the necessary foundation to create and replicate what it is that we ourselves want to enjoy, and that is individual liberty and freedom. Um, and that is something that starts in the school. It is their first exposure to it. Children learn from what you are more than what you teach. And that is absolutely true. One of the most disturbing facts about Alabama, other than we are number one in football, we're also number one in a number of teachers being arrested for uh, sex crimes with our students. Okay? That's disturbing. Shouldn't happen. Now, why is that? I, you know, I could get into a million different excuses, but I believe that that, once again, is an issue of power, exerting power over those that do not have it. This is a much better way, by example. Now, what have we done as a society over the years? We've created this huge apparatus of good intention on our pathway to you know where. So, no child left behind. I still have it on here, but a lot of uh, the states, the uh, federal government just got rid of it and replaced yet another reform that looks strangely almost like it. So we'll have to reform that in another 10 years, um, just like we did No Child Left Behind. Zero tolerance discipline. That is one of the biggest, biggest negative impacts in our schools. Uh, you're, you're, you're removing justice, you're removing reason, you're removing equity. Everything's treated the same, whether you are the fist or whether you are the face. And that is insane. And we're doing this as adults, because I, they didn't do that in the 70s and the 80s when I was a kid. We didn't have zero tolerance. The principal set us down, tried to find out what happened, and used it as a teachable moment. I now have children that they get in a fight, they get disciplined at school, and then they face criminal charges in the juvenile system on top of it. So we're double dosing their, their punishment. And once again, that is illogical. Our safety obsession, because now we have police officers in every school. Police officers in every school, doing what? Guys are hammers, everything is a nail. There's nothing for them to do. We do not have a uniformity in training of our SROs and not in any kind of responsible way to where they would be held accountable for some of the stuff that some of them do that are negative, illegal, and, and uh, outright abhorrent. Annual yearly progress. You know, it's just a, a, a nice, clever way. That was attached to No Child Left Behind, but it, it, clever way for the schools to, to sort of cook the books and be really focused on results, testing results instead of the results of what we're producing for our children. And so they, we end up obsessed half of the school year um, training toward a multiple choice test that has nothing to do and it's no measure toward our children's intelligence. It is merely a report card for the school itself. Now, I just spoke about this. This is a huge problem. I am having an, an exponential number of, of our clients that are being arrested and charged, maced, thrown to the ground, restrained, for childhood behaviors. Our public school system used to be the training ground of what social appropriate behavior was, and we were not criminalizing it on that level. I've got kids being, being charged with harassment. If I was to tell you what the legal definition of harassment is, every one of us would be guilty of it at any given time, depending on who we were talking to, especially family members. But yet on a school level, we're charging children with this. 
thus consuming more resources, more time. Now we're criminalizing these children. You know, now they're all assigned probation officers. This consumes unnecessary resources that this nation simply doesn't have to deal with problems that our, that our principals and our teachers used to deal with. They use them as teachable moments. Now we have police officers in there, and like I said, hammers see nails. Oh, that's a crime. That was harassment. Okay. So they step in, they do their job. Enforce the law. When that wasn't, that our, our, somebody asked me, James, the schools aren't a therapeutic setting. I absolutely disagree. It is society's therapeutic setting to create socially responsible children or adults. This is the training ground. That's our therapy. We send them there. We understand they're going to make mistakes. We understand they're going to get in a fight. We understand they're going to have dysregulation and, and have uh, developmentally appropriate behavior of having a meltdown every once in a while. And that's just our typical kids. We understand those things. Unfortunately, those in charge are not enforcing it that way. And in, I don't want to throw the baby out with the baby. There are some excellent administrators and teachers. It's the mass majority of them. Like I said, I don't get the calls when everything's going great. So what are the solutions? We identified the, the problems. And I will tell you, it starts with us. We vote. We educate ourselves on those little documents that I had in the very beginning that none of us are, are really familiar with anymore. They're your documents. They're your documents. They're mine. Familiarize yourself with your rights. How do you know if they're being trampled on if you don't know what they are? Be good to people. Volunteer. Be a part of something. Create your own 501c3. Give to other people. Goodness is infectious. And that's the only thing that's going to counter and, and stifle and snuff out evil. Guys, it, it cannot exist in the light. That is the only way to do it. And doing those things on the prior page, every one of them uh, will do that. Other thing is be an advocate. Be an advocate for your child. Be an advocate for other children within reason. That also goes back to educating yourself. It's not that hard. If I learn special education law, for example, you can do it. It's not that difficult. You just got to chunk it. Attend school board meetings. Nobody does that. And that's why so much is allowed to go on. That's why there's a cycle of nepotism within our education cycle. Nobody goes. Everybody complains about the schools, but nobody's there to voice their opinion and call their board members and say, we're done with this. Zero tolerance is, is over. We're not going to do this crazy stuff anymore. We need to preserve our resources. You need to tell your principals that they need to set our kids down and use these as teachable moments and not charge them with crimes. They'll listen to you if there's enough of you speaking in unison. Run for public office, meaning run for your school board. Run for positions. If you believe in individualism and you're not one of those that will be drunk on limited power, I urge you to do it. If you're one of those that said, oh, yeah, I'm going to go there and exert my con don't. <laughs> we do not need you. And if you're one of those that are doing it, you can change. Because if you don't, the people will make you. The other thing, and I put this by itself because this is the biggest one. Refuse to participate. Refuse to acknowledge other people's authority over you. Whatever their small sphere that they think that, that you, know, you are supposed to um, orbit around, don't do it. Don't acknowledge it. Power is only acknowledged if, if you do that. You nod your head and say, yeah, you have power over me. No, you don't. We can talk. We can dialogue, but no one is above you. We are all in this together. Refuse to participate, and you'll be shocked at how quick this country starts to change. What do you think happened during the Civil Rights Movement? 
How was that triggered? Rosa Parks just didn't, she refused to participate. And she refused to get up out of that seat. Something as simple as that. The last one, as far as solutions, is the most important. You can only can control you. The only tyrant that there needs to be in our lives is yourself battling your passions and controlling your own impulses. You do that, we won't have any tyrants because you'll know not to do that to other people. Everybody believes self-control is sort of passe. I do not. We need self-control. We have to monitor our own, uh, our own behaviors. And by doing that, we will treat other people in a different manner because we are now in control over ourselves. And then you need to ask yourself these questions. What are you willing to do? How much will you do? Will you stand up? Do you have the courage dis to disobey? I do. It's why I do what I do. You know, people ask me, why do you do this? If I don't do it, who will? What makes me proud is I look around, I see more people showing interest, more people that feel that there's something wrong, more people willing to say what needs to happen. And that's what I need. I need, I need people standing next to me willing to change our schools, willing to change our communities, willing to change our country. It starts with us, but at the same time, everybody needs to have the courage to do that internal review and then look at the landscape around them and say, yes, acknowledge there is a problem. Yes, we can do something about it. Positivity is the cure.